Well, good afternoon, folks. Thank you very much uh, for joining this week's In Focus uh, session. I'm Malcolm Dixon. I'm the, street, uh, the director of Street Level Photo Works. Uh, we're delighted to have two uh, photographers uh, joining us today, uh, Hugh Hood and Pete Degnan. How's it going, guys? Oh, going well, yeah. Yeah. So, Pete, you, you're in Derby, and I think you're in uh, London, Hugh. Is that correct? Right, yeah, West London. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, so I'm sure we'll have people joining today from different parts of the country. So just to remind you of the format of, of this, uh, this is for the audience, the audience's purposes. Uh, each of the photographers will speak for 20, 25 minutes and show a lot of their work. We will have brief Q&A at the end of each, uh, each of the speaker. Uh, and then we'll, we'll uh, join uh, collectively right at the end for any, um, any final comments or questions that do come in. The questions uh, can be posted on the Facebook, Facebook page itself which you will have open. So they will be uh, fed through to us and I will relay them to, to Pete and you respectively. So I'll give an introduction to both of them. Uh, I'll give an introduction to Hugh just before Hugh begins his presentation, but we're going to, going to kick off with uh, Pete today. So at the moment, Hugh, you're going to disappear from view okay. and we'll invite you back in within the next day. Uh, 30 minutes, so don't don't go away. Okay, I'll stay here. Okay. So Pete, just a brief introduction. Uh, born in Glasgow, been involved in photography since first acquiring a Zenit E SLR camera in 76. You do say, however, that you uh, your earliest recollection of photography was helping your dad develop mm -hmm. films when, when you were a boy. Which led yeah. you to become interested with the whole process. So you must have been about fifteen then. You say I was about fifteen when I when I started taking photography serious. But I can remember when I was a small kid. My dad was a member of the the Rolls Royce Camera Club, and he used to do his development at house. And I was the chief agitator with the development tank. Right. So. Very good, very good. And you'd been photographing late 70s, predominantly in the 80s, uh, from where your your archive has been revisited uh, in 2019, where, you, yeah. um, where you're bringing this all back to the surface. You've uh, published uh, a few small photo books, Mother Glasgow, The Glasgow Celtic Way, and A Comfy Govan. Profiles of your works appeared in British Culture Archive and on the website of Document Scotland. Yeah. We only met fairly recently, Pete, I think it was late 2019, uh, when you visited the gallery to, to, to show us your book, Mother Glasgow. It was at the time when we were installing the Marzaroli exhibition, which you did come back up uh, from Derby uh, to view. Yeah. Um, so uh, we appreciate that return visit very much. But just briefly, you had a chat with Oscar Marzaroli at one point during one of his exhibitions in the 80s. Is that correct? Yeah, that, that's right. It was up at the, the Third Eye Gallery. And uh, I'd gone along and I was standing with a friend of mine talking about one of the pictures. And we just became aware of this chap standing behind us. And we turned around and it was Oscar. Yeah, uh, We had a brief conversation with him. And um, he answered all the questions. And the one thing I did say to him was, you know, what's the one piece of advice you could give me? And, it, and, and all he said was, just keep taking photographs. That, that's as simple as that. Nothing technical, nothing arty-farty, just keep taking photographs. That was what he said. Yeah. And you took that advice on board. Took that advice and I'm still doing it. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And you were aware of Glasgow Photography Group as well, weren't you? Oh, that's right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Back in the 80s, uh, I, I got involved with the Glasgow Photography Group and was setting up the first street, le uh, street level up in uh, High Street. And I went along a few Sundays and helped to get out the old premises and, and got involved then. But um, yeah, it was, it was a good time. Yeah, very good, very good. And Glasgow Photography Group was the network of uh, 
photographers, which was a precursor uh, to street level photo yeah. work as we know it today. And that's for the benefit of viewers who did not know that fact. So uh, we go back a long way. So if you want to uh, screen share, Pete, and maybe okay. take us uh, through uh, through your images and uh, your journey in photography, please. Okay. Well, first of all, I'd like to thank Malcolm and Street Level for uh, asking me to to do this today. It's um, as we say, I go back a long way with the group. Um, I'm a native of Glasgow, although I moved, I moved to Derby in 97. Um, I was in the aviation industry for 45 years. I'm not a trained photographer. I've never had any formal training. So so everything um, that I've done, all, all my processing and all that has all been, been self-taught. I am really keen on what they call documentary photography, now more commonly now called street photography. And that's one of the things that um, I, I still do to this day. And I took early retirement a few years ago and then I decided that I had this negative archive that I've sat on for about um, 40 plus years. And I thought, well, it's time to get it out there. I deliberately didn't release it over the years because I thought leaving it a while, it would have more impact. Um, so the two zines that we're going to talk about today um, oh, but firstly, that's, that's me back in 87 with a full head of hair, uh, the memories. So um, I had a small dark room at home and I did a lot of work there. But uh, Mother Glasgow was my first um, zine that I decided to produce. Um, it was uh, something that I'd always wanted to do and some friends put me in touch with uh, the process for basically doing it. So I followed that zine up with um, a comfy oven. Um, a comfy oven is one of those Glasgow terms that's both informative and a threat. Um, one of those wonderful phrases. Um, I do comfy oven. I was born in the Southern General, so it was pretty apt that that's one of the, the themes for my, my zines. Um, as far as publishing the zines, I don't have a publisher. Um, I publish these myself. The, 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 I do a PDF in Lightroom, the, the book module. I do a PDF. And then for the zines, I then upload it to a company called Mixam, who do a very good job in producing zines. Um, and then for the hardback books, which I've also done of these, I uh, I use the book module in Lightroom as well. And they have a they have a, a plugin that goes straight to Blurb, the company that make the hardback books. So if anybody was interested in doing something like this, it's actually quite easy if you've got Lightroom. So Moving on to the first image, um, we're better to start than down on the Clyde if we're going to talk about Glasgow. And this was the, the Finiston Ferry, uh, one of a number of ferries that we had before we had squiggly and squinty bridges and all that sort of good stuff when, when the river was navigable up to, right up to the Central Station Bridge almost. So, um, so this was uh, the famous Betty's Bar and I managed to capture this shot just a few months before the ferry um, came to an end, but uh, yeah, it was a very famous place in Glasgow. So the next shot, um, this was uh, the general terminus key in Glasgow. It's now commonly known as the keys with the bingo hall and oh, Frankie and Benny's and all that there. But before then it was the general terminus key where all the coal and the iron ore was brought in. So a friend called me and said, Look, they're going to be blowing up the crane. Do you want to go up on the roof of the Daily Record building? So there I was on my own up on top of the Daily Record building, um, able to get these shots. And that was back in the day where there was, I didn't have a power winder. So to get the sequence of shots, I was clicking and winding, clicking and winding. Um, and then when I got to the last shot, I looked up and all I could see was this massive plume of dust coming towards me. And as there was no barrier around the top of the building, I had to lie flat for about 15 minutes till all this cleared so that I could get up and walk away. But I think it's a good historical shot of the area um, showing, you know, Kenning Park behind it and um, the, the general terminus key and it's starting to uh, get demolished. Uh, this was Kelvin Grove bandstand, um, a labor rally back in 78 in the years of Thatcher. And we have uh, Clive Jenkins standing uh, talking to the 
to the crowd. Um, so I'm up on the stage of the bandstand and down in the bottom left hand corner, you can see a small piece of someone's sleeve. That's Michael Foote. Um, he was the leader of the, the Labour Party at the time. So back in those days, security wasn't really a thing. Um, so long as you had a camera, you looked as if you knew what you were doing and had a bit of a brass neck, you could get in anywhere. So I tended to do quite a lot of that. Um, this is Tom Ferry at Radio Clyde. Um, he was uh, one of the top DJs at the time back in 77 when the new radio station opened uh, around about that time. So, so Tom was uh, doing his afternoon show uh, I just wrote into Radio Clyde and said, come and, come and take some pictures. And they said, yeah, sure. So um, he was actually live on, on the radio at the time. And um, the thing I like about this, it's a, it's a series of shots that I took. It shows the days of vinyl, the days of, um, uh, you know, postcards being written with requests on it and all that good stuff. So um, it is a kind of historical record shot. And some of the people that have seen the equipment have had a, very good nostalgia trip. So this is a band called Sneaky Pete playing down at the bandstand on Clydeside. Sneaky Pete were a very famous band in the 70s in Glasgow. Um, if you look at the, the three guys at the front, three, the two guitarists and the singer, they were brothers. Uh, Wally in the middle has unfortunately passed away. But the other two brothers, they own studios in Busby now. And uh, Duncan, the guy on the left playing the bass, he contacted me recently and said that they were putting out one of their old Sneaky Pete tracks and he had seen my photographs on the website and uh, he asked if he could use them as the backing video for the, the track, which was very nice and it, it was good to um, work with them, um, having got so much joy from them early on. Um, one of a number of football pictures that are taken, uh, this is... Uh, a fan being accosted by a policeman going in, relieving him a can of tenants there. Well, he seems to be more interested in the, the, the couple over here having a hug. Doesn't really seem to be too bothered, but, um, you know, you see the fashions, the collar shirt, you know, and you know, people just uh, coming through the turnstile there and milling about. But um, I managed to catch that there, and no doubt the, the beer tin will go in that bin. So, no catalogue of Glasgow would be complete without um, something to do with the, the religious side of Glasgow and the, the divide um, which exists between um, the two factions in Glasgow. So I wanted to capture that somehow and I decided to uh, join what was the Scottish Loyalists march from North Street in Glasgow down through Brighton across to Glasgow Green. Um, and that was really an experience. And um, I got lots of good photographs from that, I think, which are on my website, of which this is one. Um, this was the same march. And we've got the women at the window teasing the marchers. Well, the old boy down in the bottom right hand corner is enjoying himself, whistling away to the tunes. So um, I like I liked that one. I think I, I caught that one quite good. And she was, uh, she was a bit of a character. So this was when the march finally got to Glasgow Green um, and they, they finish off by playing God Save the Queen with the mass bands. And uh, they started playing it and this old boy just bolted upright, stood to attention. And I was wandering around taking photographs and the looks that he was giving me were just horrendous that I wasn't showing respect, but um, I got my photographs. So now we cross the road and we head over to the Barras, um, round about. 70s and 80s, I took a number of shots around the Barras, which uh, I thought was one of the best places ever to take photographs. Um, you, this kind of sums up what the Barras was like in a Sunday afternoon. Uh, you could buy anything, sell anything, um, and there was loads of different characters around. So um, sadly, it's not like that now, but certainly in the day, it was a great place for photographers. So this young couple caught my eye. Um, Around the corner from, from the main bars area, there was a food stand and they were having a 25p rolling sausage and uh, just standing there. But the fashions, you know, we were coming off the back of punk and going into New Romantic at that time. And the fashions, I thought, were great and the hairstyles. And um, they had, you know, caught on to the trick that, you know, on a Sunday you do your shopping in the bars, but you take it home in a Habitat bag. 
which was the neighbors don't see it. So, so yeah, they were um, they were pretty cool. I thought. So this um, the story behind this one is uh, I got behind this guy and he was playing to the crowd, you know, and the the patter was absolutely amazing, you know, some of the things. But then he just turned around and he looked at me and, and I was aware of him looking at me and he's thumping that piece of wood in his hand into his fist and he, he just came straight out and said, do you work for the DHSS? And I said, no, I'm just taking photographs. And he said, you better not be working for the, because, you know, obviously they don't want uh, their identities knowing some of these chaps. So I just kept taking photographs and as I turned away and walked into a doorway, I was met by two unsavory gentlemen who advised me where I should and should not take pictures. So um, street photography does have its uh, its dangers, but you know it, it all ended up peacefully. Thank you. <laughs> um, another couple of the characters, you know, playing to the crowds. Um, that was a big part of the day at the bars was being entertained by these guys. Um, they were selling cloth, but at the same time, you know, talking about uh, things in Glasgow and you know, winding people up and all that sort of thing. So yeah, it was it was a very entertaining place to be. And one of the entertainers we used to see there regularly was Robbie the Robot. Um, you can imagine back in 75, robots were the, the talk of science fiction and um, it was a futuristic thing. So this chap, he would dress up with um, cables hanging out and circuit boards attached to him and he would do the robotic dance moves. Um, and he had his ghetto blaster there, and he could be seen all over Glasgow at one point, but uh, he was up the barras this day, and I, caught, I captured some shots of him. I think this, this shot uh, sums up the barras, you know, a low-level shot of just people were actually selling this stuff. You, you know, you could get anything there, even the kitchen sink, you can see at the left-hand side. Um, and, and that was the great thing about the barras, you know, of... If you had something and it broke, you didn't buy a spare. You went up the barras and you found one and you paid, you know, two shillings for something and, and you got it, you know, to fit onto the bit that's broken off. So barras was great for that. Get anything up the barras. But you can see the characters there just wandering around. Um, and as I say, sadly, it's, it's not like that anymore. So we now move on to a comfy oven. Um, as I say, there was... Uh, a number of shots I took in Govan and uh, I produced the zine um, and uh, there's a lot more on my website but these were a couple of kids that were playing totally oblivious to me taking pictures. Uh, the wee guys playing with his fire engine and the girls just wandering around playing with the dog and people were actually living in these conditions you know back in the 70s which um, is, is a bit appalling. So you can see a lot of the houses are actually all boarded up and the wee guys going for a run, but there's still people living in those buildings, as you can see from the, the houses, you know, and, and the other floors. So I, I think it was important to capture that sort of thing. And, and I know Hugh's done that as well and many other photographers, but, you know, there was, there was a lot of great potential to be phot photographed in that area at that time. But, uh, you know, thankfully some of the buildings were rescued, but a lot of them were totally gone. Um, this was around the back court of another tenement, and I was wandering around taking pictures, and someone came down and emptied their bins um, and disappeared. And then this couple this, this couple appeared and started going through the bins. And somebody told me uh, later that this was called looking for luckies. You know, you would go through your neighbor's rubbish and see if they were throwing away something that you could use. So um, it, was, uh, it was something that was done at the time, but I decided to capture it. So these are another couple of guys around the back court, totally oblivious to, to me taking pictures. Um, can't remember what it was they were looking at, but they were totally transfixed on it. But again, you can see the, the, the dereliction there. But um, one thing that intrigued me was, you know, obviously school's out, but one guy's changed into his his gallus clothes with a bomber jacket and the flares, whereas the other wee guy still got his school uniform on. So um, a bit of a mixture there, but I often wondered what happened to these two. So this was Govan Cross um, in 1981. The, on, on social media, a lot of people have identified most of these people as to who they were. 
it was a it was a common place for people having been to the the market or down to the shops at Govan to to catch the taxi home. Um, and then this is one of the the main shots that are taken of Govan that people like. They think this sort of sums up Govan. I really like it because um, it's how it's the Govan that I remember with the underground there and Watson's Bar and the Ross Shire Bar either side of it. And the wee chap just sitting against the wall there and the, the old wifey in the queue and a couple of guys heading over to the Ross Shire from the shipyards. So, um, yeah, I think um, I think that sort of sums up governing. A lot of people um, say that, that it gives them a lot of good memories. So this was um, in Govan as well. This was uh, a lady that was heading to the shops. Now, what she's walking past was probably tenement buildings with lots of shops in them, but she was heading for the Govan Cross Centre. And when you look at her, I just looked at her and I thought, that's more Brune, you know, with a big coat and the, the zip-up furry boots. And and I thought, you know, that's just a typical Glasgow woman going out to get her messages, as we call it. And I also used it as a cover for Mother Glasgow because the space on the left gave me um, room to put the titles etc but I think she does sum up a Glasgow mother or mother Glasgow and this was uh, another part of Govan um, it's uh, Budley Street um, down by uh, the Breakins Bar and this street was famous for um, its shoe shops and uh, where you went with your provy check to buy your school shoes uh, I, I can remember vividly going down that street, but as you can see, it's starting to get into a state of dereliction, and a lot of that's all away now. Uh, Breakins is still standing, I believe, but the young guy on the chopper uh, kind of dates it to, to the early 80s. And then, um, round about this time, you know, 1977, the underground was going under uh, a major change, as we all know. Um, those of us in Glasgow know that we went from the old Victorian carriages made of wood to the clockwork orange and this was the days where they were stripping all the old bodies off the bogies so I just wandered into the Brunlin Roadworks which is in Govan and uh, nobody stopped me just allowed me to come in and I took a series of pictures in there just available light shots um, of a piece of history disappearing for good and then Two of Glasgow's finest walking down Water Row in Govan. You can see the Clydeside Expressway on the far side over at the River Kelvin, where the, the ferry just through those gates where they're walking to. The Govan ferry used to, to leave Water Row going over to uh, Kelvin Hall on the other side. So um, so that was the last one that I wanted to show you. Um, thank you for, for taking the time to have a look at them. Um, you can see my website's there. I've got lots more of these on the website if you want to go along and have a look. Um, and if there's any questions you have, there's, there's a contact me page on the website, which you could um, which you could do that with. Okay. Yeah. Thank you very much, Pete. That was a, a seamless presentation. Uh, I didn't feel compelled to um, to intervene at any point there. So thank, thank you very much. Okay. Nice to see those images of the Brechin Bar, um, <laughs> which, as you say, it does still stand there. You know, the uh, American linguist and activist Noam Chomsky had a paint in that bar in January of 1990. Mm. There's a photograph to prove it when there was a big conference on at the, at the Pierce Institute. Yeah. However, however. Um, Robbie the Robot, yes, yes, I think he uh, he's ingrained in the... the popular imagination, I think, uh, of people of a certain vintage. Sue McPherson uh, asks about the Celtic book, uh, the Glasgow mm. Celtic Way, and uh, is there a reprint going to be done? I should have said that sold out quite quickly, that book, didn't yeah. it? Yeah, yeah, for some reason. Yeah, I got a hundred of those printed and they just flew out. Um, I, was, I was totally amazed. But yes, I will be doing a reprint probably... Um, September time I'll, I'll do a reprint of that um, it contains the pictures I took at Jockstein's testimonial and gives the story about how I ended up in, in the centre circle with Kenny Dalgleish, McGrain and Steen um, why, how I got there and why I shouldn't have been there but I got there um, 
and there's some ga- photographs from games over the 80s and then a few pictures of fans at the end. So so that's that's flown out. Yeah. Yeah, very good. There's quite a few uh, good comments of, of coming here. I love the stories that come with the photos too, says Caroline Robertson. Ken McCluskey, good memories of Custom House Key Bandstand. Paul Curry, great to see the photos and hear the accounts and how they came about. A few other people have mentioned the uh, the Barras and the DHSS um, question there and have encountered that uh, that <laughs> response as well. Yeah, yeah. Uh, quite interesting. Um, Joss Treen, a uh, fellow photographer, are you, are you, you're, you know Joss, do you? Yes, I know of Joss. I've, I've traded posts with him on, on social media, yeah. 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 I, I know of his work, of course, yeah. Yeah, he was profiled fairly recently as well on the Document Scotland website. Uh, again, another fantastic body of work. But he asks, uh, well, he says, uh, good, good to see you, Pete, and hear your voice. Big question from Joss, though. What's next for your photography? Ah, that's, that's, that's a good question. So I'm still doing some street photography. Um, I've still got... Uh, Still got a lot of things I want to do, a few projects I want to undertake. Uh, there's, I've got a section on my website which has got more of my contemporary stuff on it. I did a thing on Brexit recently and went down to Westminster, and I've got a couple of other things on there that I was that I was working on. But you know, I, I um, I, this has been a difficult time for everybody with their photography, and some people had choices to go out or stay in. I decided to stay in. Um, being in one of the risk groups. So what I want to do now is get back out and get the projects going, getting a lot of um, shots that I can work on. I don't put all my photography on the website, obviously, or on social media, but um, I do want to continue to build up that body of work on street photography. I think the power of the pictures that we've just looked at is the the gap in time um, between when they were taken and when people look at it now. And I always tell people, and I firmly believe that what looks mundane now is gold dust in years to come. Because when I took those pictures, they were just normal street scenes. Um, They weren't contrived or anything. But no, I want to continue um, with my photography, with more street stuff, and work on some projects that I've got in mind. Yeah, okay. And as long as... Has lockdown allowed you time to to as it um, allowed you to re to focus much more on your on your archive? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, a, a few years I bought a a really good Epson uh, seven hundred, I think it was seven hundred scanner, and um, I invested in that. And the lockdown allowed me to do a lot more catching up with my archive and getting getting the work scanned in and did a bit of processing with it through Lightroom. Um, but it also allowed me to um, be more critical of my work and say, well, these are the ones I want to go on the website. I don't want these on. Um, I want to produce the zines. And, and if you look at Mother Glasgow came out in 2019, but the Glasgow Celtic Way and a comfy govern were produced during lockdown. So it did help me to focus on, although I wasn't pressing the shutter, I was I was doing something else that helped me to catch up with where I wanted to be. Yeah, and you're fully digital now, aren't you? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. I'd, I'd still have my film cameras um, that I may dig out sometime and and have a go at, but um, uh, always had the problem with the smell of fixer. Um, <laughs> that, was, that was always a problem when I mean, you have a dark room at home. So. Um, I may take the film, but shots, but uh, maybe just get it processed. Yeah. Okay. Well, the next time you come up to Glasgow, um, bring any uh, unprocessed film with you, and uh, right. yeah, we'll see see what we can do there. Okay. So there's no immediate questions coming through right now. Okay. But stay with us, Pete. You'll disappear off screen, but then you'll join us again at the end, and we'll. Um, uh, we'll switch over over to Hugh uh, now. So, so see you in a bit, Pete. Yeah. yeah. Okay, Hugh. Yeah, I'm good. Still with us. Very good. Very yeah, good. Very good. Very interesting to hear what Peter, you know, how he's describing his pictures and 
Yeah. Must be kind of run parallel at the same time for some of that date. So I was looking at the times it was made. So, um, uh, but yeah, yeah, very interesting. So, uh, uh, so I mean, you you started your uh, photographic career, uh, you say, at the age of 10. That's um, right. It's almost the same as Peter. My old man used to, he was an electrician, and as his hobby, he had the dark room. And uh, we lived in the Rotten Row, and it wasn't, it was a tenement. Yeah. And he would use one of the bedrooms, uh, you know, set up the, the, the light, get the fixer and developer up. I used to love just helping him, you know, with the yeah. printing. And of yeah. course, smell a fixer, I absolutely loved that smell. So, uh, <laughs> so yeah, so that started really quite early. And he always had lots of different cameras. So, uh, yeah. But yeah, it was good. Okay. So in 1972, you bought your first creative camera magazine and uh, you were influenced by Robert Frank and uh, Lee Friedlander. And that's what inspired you to uh, go out in your meanders and take photographs on the streets of Glasgow. Uh, you moved to London in 1980 to start a course at the Polytechnic of Central London. But you lost all of your 35 mil uh, negatives. Um, but luckily, they resurfaced again 26 years later. Uh, I think in your uh, brother's house, uh, it was your brother who discovered them. Yeah. That's right. Yeah, I mean, it was, you know, after about 78, I stopped doing what you'd call street photography, documentary photography. And um, by 1980, I'd moved to London to do the course at the PCL. And, you know, for whatever, how many years that was, I don't know, maybe 20 years or so more, I'd never even thought of those negatives that were left behind. And then my brother one day said, there's a lot of things up here that have to be cleared out. So, there's all these books of negatives, why don't you come and pick them up? And so the next time I was up in Glasgow, exactly, I, I um, picked them up. Of course, the next thing I had to do was buy a film scanner. And um, so I started scanning them in. And um, once you've scanned them in, you think, well, what am I going to do with these scanned images next? So, um, so I thought the best thing to do would be to send the files up to the Mitchell Library in Glasgow. Maybe some for a reference or some history project someone might want to use. So um, so I sent them up there and got a nice letter back saying they would put them up or store them in some in some capacity. So um, so yeah, that was it. And um, of course, they stayed there, didn't hear anything for a long time. And I think you know the story of um, Alan Brown, yeah. who a journalist was looking for some images to go with his book about Glasgow. And that was just the start of what we're now kind of going through now where they created a good interest in, in, the, in the images. Yep. So much so, so that um, Cafe Royal Books, um, Craig um, got really interested. And uh, so it produced the, the um, Cafe Royal Books. And uh, so, yeah, so it's great. It's been good. It's been yeah, interesting. Been three, three Cafe Royal Books so far. I mean, they've all sold out in their first run, I think. Yeah. Uh, a couple of them might be into their third, their third uh, printing edition, perhaps. Mm -hmm. But I think um, just to go back to what you were saying there, Alan Brown connection. It was maybe about 2010 or 11 you originally got in touch you, um, but it wasn't until 2012 or 13 that Alan Brown did get in touch when he found your negatives um, or prints in the Mitchell Library in the Glasgow room there. When he was the book you mentioned was. The Glasgow Smile and A to Z of the Funniest City on Earth. Uh, a couple of the images of yours were used in that book. And um, we worked on a big exhibition that was held in Tromgate 103, in fact. And uh, there was an afternoon of events with a Glasgow theme. Mm. It involved you and Alan uh, in discussion. It involved um, the band uh, The Trembling Bells. Um, as well as a reception for the work itself. So, um, can you see this? this yeah, is, yeah. Here I you see. are with Alan. Yeah, yeah there we that, are. That, that was in 2013. Uh, the talk in the gallery, very well attended. You can see the, uh, the equipment of Trembling Bells at the back there. The reception in the foyer. The Trembling Bells, that's Alan Brown in the middle. And your good friend, uh, yeah. Graham. Who has that big geezer with the sunglasses? On the left-hand side, yes. Um, 
other people you met at the time, Ken McCluskey, a bit of a fan of your work, and hopefully, hopefully you're a fan of of, uh, of Ken's uh, music also. And uh, Trish Pete was along that day. Uh, oh, yeah. yeah. Well, David Pete, um, yeah. the late David Pete, that is, um, who also took some fantastic documentary shots of Glasgow. The exhibition that was on at Tromgate 103, we... Um, we also put on a platform in Easter House at Lily Art Gallery in Mulgai, alongside the work of Donny McLean, and then also at uh, Hillhead Library. And there's uh, Jimmy McGregor mm. of uh, Jimmy McGregor and Robin Hall fame, broadcaster and writer, when he came to visit your exhibition at Hillhead Library. So I just wanted to uh, to to share yeah. some, some snaps of you snaps of you there, Hugh. Yeah. But I think probably uh, enough of me now because okay. you've got a lot of images similar to Pete's that you want to uh, you want to lead us through. So if you want to uh, share your screen now, Hugh. Okay. So um, take it away. Okay. Sure. Okay. So I've got to bring this up here. Okay, is that visible now? Yep. You're right. Okay, well, I used to have a lot of hair at one stage, as you can see. So, um, but anyway, this isn't my um, epitaph, you know, in 74, 78. So, um, but anyway, so this, that's it. So I'm going to start, well, at the beginning, I suppose, um, having read Creative Camera and some other books like that, um, I decided to go and do some street photography. And this is one of the first locations I ever went to. And this is in the Gorbals. And um, yeah, it was absolutely the, the beginning. And um, I don't know if it's visible on the bottom right, but there's two little girls playing in the street in the same way. I don't know if, it, if, it's, if, if you can see it. But anyway, these were the two little girls that were playing. And um, as I say, it's my first attempt at street photography. And uh, although I had been a trained photographer doing more commercial work, this was what I would do at weekends. I would go out, you know, living in Gibson Street. We'd just go for a walk all around Glasgow, take my camera with me. So another thing about um, Glasgow and most cities at that time, children played in the streets. It wasn't like, you know, they were indoors that like they seem to be now. So anyway, I've kind of jumped a bit. This is over by um, St. George's Cross. And uh, again, it's street photography that uh, I was really, really enjoying doing. So uh, I'm, I'm beginning to sort of really get into it. Again, this is over in um, St. George's Cross. I think you can see uh, St. George's Road in the background there. And all the kids, it's amazing when you see that they were just playing in the street, keeping themselves occupied. Now, uh, Hugh, you were a student at the Glasgow yeah. College of Building I did that, and Planning. Yes. Uh, yeah, the College of Printing, and then I was working for a, a big commercial company in Glasgow called Studio Swain, which was advertising and various things like that. They would do really uh, top-end stuff, and they had a giant studio, and uh, and that's where really I, I learned my trade. Also, in that stage, I would also be learning colour processing, colour printing, the whole the whole kind of different aspects of it, and. Um, so yeah, that was great. And, you know, this is a shot from um, up where the Chinese school is, up near the um, art gallery, um, the yeah. School of Art. So Camden Hill. Camden Hill. Yeah. yeah. I don't know if it's still there, if they still have their own school. Um, yes. But yeah. that's, that's one of the things I'd like to do is actually revisit some of these locations. You know, it'd be something I would quite like to do um, when, when the time is right. You know, I know a lot of it has changed. Um, I mean, I think this one is actually in Govan. I can't quite remember. Um, I don't know if Peter remembers this, but uh, it looks very similar to some of his, um, the children playing, the middens in the background. Uh, and, uh, well, here's the Red Road Flats, of course, which I think must be the most photographed buildings maybe in Glasgow. But, uh, but here it was in the 70s when it's still obviously a very nice well, a decent place to live. And um, yeah, it's, it's great. It's another view of... 
Now this is uh, an area called um, Plantation. And I was just fascinated by the fact that the way they have been taking down some of the buildings, but left some of them standing. And there was still some people I think in there. Um, I, it was just incredible. In fact, it's an area of Glasgow I didn't really know at the time. Um, it was on one of my walks. And um, it was just fascinating to, to see how they could completely take something down. And again, I don't know what's in its place there. But anyway, um, I've created this from someone else's work and my work. Um, I came across this Plantation Street 1965, Eric Watt. And I realized actually it's kind of very similar background to one of my shots here on the left. And in the space of like 10 years, buildings have completely gone. But interestingly, the crane and the, um, the little rotunda are still in the same place. But, but yeah, it's just fascinating to go back to visit places and see how it's changed. It's interesting you share that image uh, by Eric Watt. Eric mm. was a fairly active photographer mm. uh, back then and right up until uh, the 90s, uh, now passed away, unfortunately. But his, uh, mm. his archive was in the keeping of Queen's Park uh, Camera Club, who recently bequeathed it to Glasgow Museums. So I think there are plans uh, within Glasgow Museums to do something with that work in terms of an exhibition and a book. So that's just a little footnote, Hugh. Yeah, so. no, it's good because I think a lot of this work can disappear. I mean, the images, the negatives can get, can disappear and I think it's great to save them and, and for them to be used, you know, as a great reference material. Now, this is another, this is Mary Hill now. This is just off Mary Hill Road looking down I can't remember the name of the street, but again, it's when I realized there was certain urban landscapes that I really like doing. And this, this is one of the ones that I really like. And again, it's this way that they take down some of the tenements and leave some of it up, you know. And uh, again, it's a great record of what Glasgow used to look like. Um, Springborn Labour Party. Um, Oh, this is uh, another thing that you see in Glasgow where, again, they remove um, most of the tenement, but obviously leave the underground building there. And in the background, you've got new flats going up. Again, this is the Gorbals. And I think those buildings in the background have subsequently been taken down again, haven't they? So uh, they didn't last for very long. But again, you know, street photography. And here is uh, Gas Cube Road. Again, another structure left behind when all the tenement has disappeared. And I think the area behind that is uh, Phoenix Park, which I don't even think exists any longer in Glasgow. I don't know if many people would remember that area. Um, here we go, Site Hill, again, urban landscapes. By this time I'd stopped doing the, um, what I'd call those, those images of uh, the kids, you know, um, and this, this is interesting because it says on the bus Glasgow 800, so I'm assuming that's 1975, wasn't it? We have the Waverley. We also have the Daily Record building where I think Peter said he took the shots from of the, um, the destruction of that other site on the other side of the river. So uh, again, yeah, 1975. And of course the bridge itself is 50 years old, is it? This month or something? Or this year? Indeed, yes. It's the yeah. anniversary of that build, uh, that bridge. Yeah. Yeah, that's great. This is uh, Glasswood Street in a very wet uh, afternoon. Um, I don't know if you recognise the bar. I don't know what the name is, but I wonder if it's still there. It isn't there any longer. It's gone, is it now? That's well okay. gone, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you've obviously been in there maybe a few times, but uh, but this is uh, this is a very popular print. Uh, it's it's um, in the salt market, kids swinging on some chain from somewhere. Again, uh, street photography. And this is probably my only shot of the bar, as although I know I know I did take a lot more than this. And this is the basically ro roller chat. You know, it was, as Peter says, a place where you would get all sorts of street things going on besides all the selling and everything. And uh, it's just a fascinating to go on a Sunday afternoon with your camera and uh, capture it. I mean, again, 
I mean, I'd say 50% of my negatives I haven't found again. I mean, that is one of the things that when I recovered what I do have, there's still a lot missing. Um, so one day I'm hopefully I'll get more shots of the bars. Um, this is the old crazy house. Um, used to sell clothes. You know, on a Sunday, I don't know if that's the guy that owns it, but you know, they, they do something to attract people to the, to the shop, certainly outside it anyway. And uh, yeah, no, I like this picture quite a bit. It's slightly. I shared that. Uh, I shared that image, uh, Hugh, on on my Facebook, and it uh, generated a, a little bit of discussion from last evening into today about Crazy House, which was something of an Aladdin's cave. Mm, yeah, no, I didn't. I don't think I ever went in as well. So uh, you know, wish I had your description of it now. So. Uh, <laughs> But anyway, this is Mr. Guzzi. These were Italians who created all these plaster molds, quite often for churches, you know, for crucifixions and all the rest of it. Lots of busts of famous um, sculptures. Now, I don't know if it's possible to see, but on in the left-hand window, there's a there's a cat, there's a little thing, little kind of sculpture of a cat. And after the 103 exhibition, 103 Tronga exhibition. I was contacted by uh, a woman uh, called Linda, who used to be the, a police sergeant of this area. I think it was Bread of Lane Street. And she would go in there and have her tea, you know, and all the rest of it. And eventually uh, she bought that cat. And then she contacted me and sent me a picture. And this is the actual cat that was in that window. So that's, I'd really love when you get the feedback, there's a connection where people see something or see themselves. Um, there's another image which I don't actually have at the moment where uh, there's an elderly couple looking in a window. And then I was contacted from Canada by uh, her, one of their daughters who spotted this in, um, in one of the, the magazines. And uh, they can't, and to say that, you know, that, that, that was their, their mother. It was amazing. Anyway, this is another popular one in, for Glasgow. Um, it's quite late on a Saturday night and people are staggering home. The burger van is open, of course. But the interesting thing for people now is that structure behind, I think there's a building on top of it. Um, it looks like a flyover. And um, it's, it's quite interesting to see now with the, with the, I think it's offices or something above it. But yeah, the guy who owns the burger van, he's, he's, which is actually not the same van as the one in the image, he's got a new version. But he, um, he bought a print of this, and I think it's in the van. So, uh, again, quite nice. Well, here's the original Jerry Snack, snack Bar, um, which is in Clyde Bank, actually. Um, and if you could see it in color, it's bright yellow with red lettering. Um, but this is the old days of documentary street photography where it had to be black and white, you know. Um, OK, this is Anderson with the buttery restaurant behind. And I don't know if this is the flyover that goes anywhere or it's one of those ones that uh, it's just the footbridge. But, um, but yeah, this, this is quite interesting. It's the, the sort of the shapes and everything, and the kids playing, of course. Um, uh, back, I think we're in Govan now. I think we're in Peter's territory um, where there's still ships on the Clyde and uh, the giant granary still there behind. But you can see on the left that it's really starting to knock down a lot of the buildings. And uh, so it's, it's on its way. Bit of the shipyards. Uh, again, on the ferry, I don't know, I can't remember which one this was, if it was Finiston or York Hill. Uh, obviously, the guy that's piloting is a bit lost and being told to um, turn left a bit. Now, I think this is Finiston. I don't know if Peter would recognize it or is it? Uh, like is it fin Finiston? Looks like it. Yeah, I, I, as I say, I've, my memory of a lot of this is a bit, a bit lacking, but yeah, it's Finiston. And that one that you had were Betty's Bar, wasn't it? I think yeah. that's, that's probably the same. I don't, oh, I, could, I'm getting, I, I have no idea where that's coming, but, uh, but yeah, that was great because that was all part of the walk when I walked from Gibson Street down. Um, Byers Road to York Hill, got a ferry, ended up south of the river and just walked. It was a, it was a great pastime. Now, Terry's tattoo, um, 
I don't know if that's near, is that still near um, street level gallery? Is it around the corner? It is, yes, it's in an adjacent yeah. street and uh, it's still in existence. Yeah. Um, fortunately, the, the frontage has been uh, upgraded somewhat. Oh. It's uh, not as stylish as this one here. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, that's a good old days. Here we are, the classic um, working men's pub. I, I, I'm going to say it's, this is probably in Govan, only because, you know, I quite often ended up there, but um, but yeah, that was quite amusing. The days when you could smoke in, inside. Ah, uh, this is um, near Glasgow uh, under the bus station in in just off Argyle Street. Uh, very wet afternoon. And here is Bridge Street Underground. Which is, um, which is, I don't know how many of the underground stations you actually get light coming in, like nice daylight to make it look, you know, nice. Even uh, the interior of the... Now, the, this is the workshop, like Peter, I think one Friday I got in and uh, I, I mean, these guys were maintaining the, um, all the carriages, taking the stuff apart. And uh, yeah, it was fascinating. In fact, I've got some color slides of that and that's the only color slides I've got of Glasgow. Anyway, this is my last screenshot with um, the three magazines I think are still available at um, street level. And uh, I think that's it pretty much. Yeah. So those, uh, those zines are available uh, yeah. through street level, Hugh. I think uh, that should be shared on the Facebook page. You'll certainly find uh, Hughes Zines and Pete's uh, on our website shop as well. Well, thank you very much, you. Um, same with Pete. Lovely yeah. presentation. What a, an amazing record of of, uh, of a time and a place. And it looks like um, you've both kind of trod the same territory to some extent, sometimes maybe in different years, but... Um, it's interesting. There's a lot of work out there that, that has chronicled and documented um, Glasgow uh, through its various uh, constructions and deconstructions and reconstructions and uh, something much more has to be done with all of that work. But it's great that it's resurfaced and uh, is available in this print form for people yes. to see, you know. That's right. And of course, I think you've got prints available at street level as well, haven't you? We do, we do. Yeah. So, um, it's very lucky that the negatives were found by your brother. It yeah. just makes you think how easily yeah. whole archives can just be thrown out sometimes by mistake, you know? Yeah, that's true. But is there anything else missing of yours, do you think, you? Oh, that... definitely, because, I mean, in fact, one of the... I mean, okay, I love creative camera, but one of the books that I still own from 1974 was Tony Ray Jones, A Day Off. And that was about the English at the seaside. And yeah. it's a fantastic book. And uh, I'd recommend that, you know, try and get a copy of it. And having got a copy of that, I decided that I was going to go down to Salt Coats, um, Largs, or any, I mean, the places down the river. And that's, Quite a, a lot of films that I've missed is the are missing is the stuff that I went down maybe um, you know in the Glasgow Fair down to uh, Saltcoats around that area and Dunoon definitely went to just doing street photography of Glasgow people on holiday um, as I say inspired by Tony Ray Jones's book and uh, so the other stuff there's more of Glasgow a, a bit. I think there's some more I mean the the thing was that. Although I got the negatives, you know, at the same time, I had to have a knee operation. So it meant that I couldn't do anything for three months. So having bought the scan, I had the negatives. It was just a way of, you know, a great thing to do, you know, catch up. A lot of them have damage on it. But for the most part, you know, got rid of it in Photoshop. But yes, yeah, it's, yeah it's, good. it's good. And one day I'm hoping, fingers crossed, that will turn up. And of yeah. course, there's... You were mentioned the last time we spoke about the, the, the possibility that I might have been photographed by um, Oscar Mazzaroli, because I know he worked a lot in the, well, he's got a lot of shots from the Rotten Row, which is where we lived till I was about 10. And me and my brother definitely remember a photographer with a, 
six by six camera, a Roliflex type camera, who um, was taking photographs in the rock and roll and he took our picture. And so it'd be great one day to get into the archive there and just have a good look and see if it was me and my brother standing like street urchins in the rock and roll. So, um, but yeah, that'd be great. I think that might be possible at some point in the not too distant future, Hugh, uh, the, the archive, the Oscar Mazzaroli archive is in the, the safekeeping of Glasgow Caledonian University, we're, we're glad, glad to say. So that will be to some extent uh, publicly accessible, or at least it will be accessible as a resource. But individual next, I'm, uh, I'll put you in touch at some point with the archivist there and see whether what you're describing uh, rings rings any bells. Mm. Um, but that that would be uh, that would be a fascinating discovery. But it sounds like uh, when you were doing this work, you were very much uh, self motivated in yeah. doing it. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. It wasn't. I mean, as I say, because five days a week I was working, so you had the weekends off, and so it was just an interest. Uh, as I say, inspired by some books, I wanted to do street photography, Friedlander, you know, Robert Frank type things, and. Uh, yeah, so it was great just to get out and also, you know, walking around Glasgow. But as Peter also said, you're, you're doing stuff and you think, well, that's just an everyday thing. Why are you taking pictures in the street like that? You know, it's just every day. But as Peter said, it's maybe many years later, actually, that, you know, they get that currency where people are really interested to see what it was like, especially your children. They want to look back and see, see what, what the cities was like, you know. And Glasgow particularly, I don't know about many other cities, has really changed. I mean, from the 60s. In fact, I remember when the, um, the uh, that urban motorway was being built and you know, the Kirkadens where we lived. And uh, I mean, it took away places like Phoenix Park and all these and the flyovers. And I, I mean, I've got actually stuff I haven't shown, which is all the urban motorway that I took at the time. And um, yeah, I mean, it's that really, again, decided that would be great just to record all that. But, um, and that's what, as I say, that's where the, the benefit of doing it at the time is, yeah. is that in history, they'll, they'll, they'll be thankful we've gotten all these images, you know? Yeah. So. And indeed, as I say, the, the fact that yourself and Pete have uh, shared them publicly. So maybe Pete can rejoin us uh, now. And you've maybe partly answered a question here, which is uh, directed at, at both of you. And it's uh, from Paul. Curry, who asks, is there anything particular about Glasgow amongst other Scottish cities that has made it such a rich source of street documentary photography from your own points of view? From, from my point of view, obviously my, I am a Glaswegian and a lot of what I learned about Glasgow came from my parents and my grandparents. And they used to tell me about times that, you know, they lived in which were no longer there. So I felt compelled at the time to go out and try and capture things before they disappeared. Now, um, back, in, back in those days, you know, I didn't really get around many, many other Scottish cities um, like Dundee or Inverness or, or even Edinburgh for that for that matter. So so Glasgow was um, going through a tremendous <clears throat> period of transformation um, at that time. So it was great to be able to get out in the street with the camera and try and record some of that. But I'm pretty sure there's other photographers in places like Dundee and Edinburgh um, that have captured similar images. The, on, the only thing that um, I'm disappointed about is back in that day compared to this day, um, we're going to have generations of children that are airbrushed out of history uh, because we can no longer safely take images of children. I mean, if you look at the picture that's on the screen at the moment, of one of Hugh's shots, um, to take that picture nowadays would be pretty risky. Um, so that's that's the only thing. The, the kids in Glasgow these days is um, are not going to be recorded and that, that makes me sad. Yeah, yeah. So Hugh, you can stop uh, sharing your screen now okay. if you don't mind, Jay. Yeah. You're sharing it, stop, yeah, okay. Well, okay. 
That is a good point, uh, Pete. But I think it, it still happens, but in different ways. It's a different uh, different process. Mm. Certainly, consent uh, is uh, justifiably required uh, in this in this day and age. But it does uh, change the the nature of of the record uh, mm. to some degree. But things have diversified, and projects exist in many different forms. The nature of documentary mm. has. Uh, transmogrified into many different kinds of forms as to what the classical documentary used to be to the different um, sub-genres that uh, currently exist within that description. But uh, is there any question that you would ask of one another uh, from seeing one another's presentation? Yeah. Well, I'm just surprised how the same locations we were at. I don't know whether there's certain places that you get attracted to as a photographer, like Govan. Um, well, the Gorbals, even when I started doing, uh, it was already really under complete redevelopment, most of it. There's very few streets left, the old traditional tenements. So, um, but yeah, so Govan was great. I'm surprised we never bang, banged into each other because I think, I don't know, Peter, Peter was working as well during the day. So it was maybe yeah. on the weekends you take yeah. shots. You know. and, it, and, and it's it's interesting. Um, you mentioned Eric Watt. I, I knew Eric from Queens Park Camera Club, um, and I'd seen quite a lot of his work ov over the years. And I'm starting to see it all coming back again now, with people appreciating what it is he's done. Mm. But you know, back in Glasgow in in the early mid '70s, it was uh, it was an interesting place. And yeah. when you walked about the street where an expensive camera, particularly in some of the places that we wanted to take pictures. Yeah, you, you just had to be careful. Yeah, well, I think, like, the, I, I never had any trouble in Glasgow. I don't remember getting any, but, you know, I probably wouldn't really do it now. Or certainly, you know, because the whole thing with street photography and taking people's images, it's become such a, a point where, what you, how are you going to use the image? Whereas in the 70s, no one really cared. They'd probably more likely to jump in front of the camera to be in the shot. You yeah. know? And it was unusual. I didn't meet any other photographer, although I do have a, an image and in the background as a photographer. I don't think it was you outside the crazy house in 1975. <laughs> so way in the distance. And it's only when it was kind of that blow up moment when I was just enlarging the screen and I kept going in. And there was a photographer with a Pentax Spotmatic camera, long yeah. hair. And I thought, geez, I never noticed that before. Yeah. You know? and, uh, I've been trying to find this photographer. You know, I just thought it'd be interesting to yeah. me. You might have a shot of me from the you other angle. Right? You never know. But one, yeah. one thing I noticed is, and, and it's in one of my pictures, particularly of the Barris that we didn't look at today, but it's on the website. I'm taking a picture, <coughs> excuse me, and everybody's looking at me. Yeah. And I'm saying, I've seen that somewhere before. And if you look at Annan's pictures, Thomas Annan's pictures, Everybody's standing, staring at the camera. So even in the in the seventies and eighties, people were still doing that. Yeah, you no, know, yeah. a guy with a camera. I wonder yeah. who he is, and everybody stands and looks at you, and yeah. and that's where I saw the the comparison in the two pictures. Yeah, because you think back then, people only took families took pictures when it was a birthday party or a wedding. It was an event. You wouldn't you wouldn't yeah. take their instamatic onto the street and just take snaps, you know. In, in the yeah. Because, uh, you know, my father, he would process films for other people, and it was just all family-type pictures, you know. And uh, But, you know, when I started taking pictures, people were saying, well, what are you going to do with them? I mean, that's a bit odd, isn't it? Just taking pictures of strangers. Who are these people, you know? So, yeah. uh, but even now, I say it's, it would be, I'd, I'd think, twice maybe. But, um, but having said all that, I would like to revisit some of my location stuff to see. Yeah. You know, like I'd done with um, Eric Watts, and you know, you have... The original one from the seventies and yeah. then two thousand and twenty image. Well, well, you took that. You took that picture on the Clyde, looking across to the Granary. Yeah. In the seventies, well, I revisited that in the eighties. Now I've got a very similar shot from almost the same vantage point. Oh, I and the houses were... are all gone, and there's no boats there. So, so we, and now we, the Granary's we, not there. Yeah, I think we were in contact about that, wasn't it? Or, yeah. I think yeah. so. Yeah, yeah, because that almost looked exactly the same shot. Yeah, about. Yeah. But yeah, no, that's it's it's different. Um, yeah. yeah, I mean, I don't suppose at the time when you're taking these photographs as much younger men, you're thinking these are going to have some cultural re resonance. Uh, 30, 40 years down the line, you're just recording as you go along. You're living mm -hmm. in the contemporary moment. Yeah. 
Yeah. Um, yeah, and, and and I always say that you know none of these pictures I've shown today are ever going to win any awards or anything, but the reward that comes from it is seeing people's reaction when they look at them, like people saying that's one of the best pictures of my dad I've ever seen. He died 15 years ago, you know, and that, that that's nice for people to have that sort of image of their, their parents going about their daily business rather than a formal picture at a party or something. And and that's that's rewarding. Yeah. Okay. And have you exhibited any of your work, Pete? Um, the only time I've ever exhibited work on, on a wall, so to speak, is um, Paisley Arts Centre, probably back in the 80s. They gave me some space in the in one of the, the bars where I could put my work up. And um, that went quite well. You know, that was quite well received. But no, I've, I mean, I've got I've got the website and the zines. I mean, that's how I share my work at the moment. Yeah, at the moment. But yeah. <laughs> forms are not another outlet, so let, let's keep in touch about that. Yeah. Um, yeah, uh, Paul Curry asks again of you, but I guess it's the same with yourself, Pete. Where are your negatives stored now so that they don't get lost? I mean, obviously, both of you have digitised them, but it's still very important to keep those originals because the digital can evaporate someday. Yeah. So uh, you both have them in your respective homes? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I've scanned most of them. But as you say, I mean, the hard drive can go. I mean, I have them on two different drives, of course, but to make sure I um, that nothing really happens. And I think I've got them on the cloud. So, uh, but yeah, no, it's, and I think the negatives are still deteriorating because I think, I don't know if it was just when my parents, there were big smokers, there was dampness, you know, it was really a Glasgow tenement flat, water running down the windows. And I think that affected the negatives. It's a, there's a mold mm. that's called spider mold running all over it. So I tried cleaning them, but yeah, you have to, the negatives, you need to really scan them and keep a few copies in different places. And, yeah. Uh, yeah. I, 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 always, I always made sure, I'd, first of all, I thoroughly washed the yeah. film. And, you know, I always spent a lot of time making sure it was washed because I, I knew that that was one of the things that could make them go off over the years. But I've just got them in a drawer here in negative archival negative pages. And um, I've got a couple of uh, big ring binders full of them. Um, I've also got some slides. I've even got um, my dad's old Kodachrome slides of the family from years ago. And a lot of them are actually good records as well. But but like you, I've, I've got backups and I've got a backup somewhere in, in, in a mountain somewhere in America that uh, backs up my photographs regularly. So, yeah. But in the meantime, I would recommend a fireproof safe. Yeah. But not yeah. too expensive. <laughs> Well, the other thing you could do is send the scans to the Mitchell Library. I'm just for Peter could do it because I know I've sent most of mine and and they have digital scans there. I don't yeah. know what they do with it, but again, it's another location, isn't it? Yeah. It is, yeah. yeah, yeah. It's, it's something I'll look into. Yeah, there are a couple of collections within Scotland, but we can talk about that um, uh, post, post this uh, discussion. Yeah. I think there's no uh, direct questions coming back. Lots of good comments. Um, great lunchtime made our someone's lunch break very educational. <laughs> uh, George Williamson, really interesting to hear this discussion from two Scottish stalwarts of photography. <laughs> <laughs> oh, great, brilliant. So um, I think everyone uh, has enjoyed it, as have I. So I, I hope... The exercise of this and participating has been useful for, for both of yourselves yeah. as well. Uh, quite a good crowd uh, joined us today, but this will be uploaded onto our Facebook and we will share it on our YouTube as well. So it will remain as a lasting record okay. um, that other people can, can view. So I think uh, we'll just draw it to a close now, if that's okay with the, the two of you, Jen. Yeah, yeah, um, thank you very much. That was great to be on, and thank you for the invite. And, yeah, uh, thank you. If, uh, you. if both of you just uh, remain on your Zoom at the moment, okay. uh, until we, we close the Zoom, we'll just say, we'll say goodbye to, uh, to the audience now. Thanks for joining us, and look out for our next series of talks. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.